Good morning and welcome to yet another episode of Beyond Bitcoin. I'm missing my partner, which is Derek. He is taking a few weeks of leave for taking care of some personal stuff. He's missing that Australian accent and the, the energy that, you know, that Derek brings. But we are very fortunate to have this conversation with Mark. Mark, you're the CIO of Portal Asset Management. We've worked together for almost five years now. So yeah. such a joy. So welcome again to Beyond Bitcoin. Thanks. Thanks, Nathan. I love I lived in Australia for almost six years, so I can I can do the Aussie accent if it makes you feel better. We can, <laughs> no. we yeah. feel I, I think we should, easy we, should we should give it a try. But but your but your German slash African accent just works just fine for to bring diversity to the show. But hey, interesting. I, I heard a trend, Mark, that every time you take some time off, it's yeah. not good for the crypto markets. That happened last time. That happened this time. So tell us more. What's going on? What are you doing in your time off? That's causing this uproar in, 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 in the industry. Well, obviously, I must be playing a big role in the in, in, in keeping are, the global economy are. ticking over. It's, it's literally yeah. the I'm the best predictor. Every time I go away, markets <laughs> seem to find a reason to, to sell off on some unknown news. I think in this instance, it had nothing to do with crypto specifically. We saw, first of all, the a bit of weak data out of the US, some weak earnings reports at the beginning of August. But then what was a really interesting occurrence or development was that Japan began hiking interest rates and that caused this unwind of the, the yen dollar carry trade. And that's fed through into all asset classes because what funds, particularly hedge funds, have been doing is borrowing cheaply in Japan and then investing in equities bonds with a much higher yields and rates. And when the interest rate parity kicked in, it caused a, quite a knee-jerk reaction and quite a sell-off. That is also coupled to the fact that the US was very slow in raising rates to, to battle inflation in 21. And then they did it all in 22 and put a real span in the works, caused a big pullback in global liquidity. And now they're way too slow in cutting rates again. So they're almost forcing, if not contributing directly to a recession and not such a soft landing, a hard landing in the US. And that fed through across all asset classes. It wasn't just, it wasn't just crypto, but crypto does get hit pretty hard because it trades 24 seven and is pretty liquid. So it does tend to be the canary in the coal mine. No, oh, that's amazing. And that's the, I think that's attributable. In fact, I, I heard the headlines this morning as well, is that BOJ has indicated, or at least in terms of raising rates, I don't know what impact's going to have uh, on that, which is, it's hinting at more rate hikes. And I think Japan in its last decade, for the longest time, had ZERP environment. And that's changing. So I don't know what impact is going to have. But switching back to the US, of course, we all have been observing Jerome Powell and there was a SALT event in Jackson Hole preceding the normal Jackson Hole sort of summit that they have once a year where you have central bankers and it is really meant to be an academic exercise back in the day and now those begin to have, you begin to have Jerome Powell's of the world opine and indicate as to where the direction is. And I think there's clear indication from the last speech that he had at Jackson Hole event a few weeks back that the interest rates would be cut because they're satisfied with taming the inflation, if they can call that mark. Love to get your perspective on this where you are. I see interesting, maybe the data that they collect, which we've seen in some, some correction in jobs numbers as Department of Labor came back in the US, which indicates the two primary functions central banks have, and we'll get to how we connect this thinking to crypto in a minute. But there's an indication that they may cut rates. They may cut rates as, as deep as 50 basis points, which is quite significant given that we've had all these raises and, and they kept their rates steady for some time since the last, I would say, 18 months. That plus a dismal job market that we begin to see, a, a cooling down of wages, which leads to global economic overall spend that feeds the, the beast in general. How do you reconcile these things with, at the end of the day, whether it's institutional crypto in form of ETFs or people looking into crypto as a discretionary income going flowing into into crypto, how do you see this besides the innovation narrative, Mark? I, I, to me, it's a lot to digest in terms of data and predicting the impact of inflow of these funds going to direct crypto or indirect crypto through ETFs. That's a good question because there are a lot of moving, a lot of moving parts. So I think after his, his speech, and his, his change in comments saying, look, I think we, we now need to cut rates. I, I was hoping for at least three, hopefully four cuts by, by January. And I'm hoping that they move quicker than expected. So I'm hoping for 50 basis points between now and December and then maybe 25 in January just to, to slowly take. But you must remember that the U.S. hasn't cut rates in almost five years. So yeah. it is going to be a big liquidity event. And you're going to see, a, I think, quite a shift 
out of high yield and fixed income back into what we call longer duration risk assets. In other words, assets that maybe have a lot of growth ahead of them, but aren't producing much cash now. And I think crypto, um, particularly the alts, is in that space. We were talking a bit earlier offline about how Ethereum has taken strain because of all the competitors that have been coming through and taking traffic away, including the likes of Ton and others. And potentially what I see is number one, you're going to have this continued debasement of currency that hasn't slowed down. So the US and, and globally, in fact, but the US is still printing a lot of money, which is it's debasing currency. There's also, and if you saw this latest, it, it was at the Wells Fargo, this glitch that they've been having. Was it Wells Fargo? It was Wells Fargo, this glitch that they've been having. So there's the threats of cybersecurity because people still trust that the money in the bank is their money and they haven't really cottoned onto the fact yet that it's not. So yeah. their money's been collateralized and fractionalized. And then I think number three, if I take a look at where do I see, where do I see growth? Where do I see innovation? Where do I see growth? And where do I see it, where do I see it being attacked and stifled? And it has been, unfortunately, through the SEC in the US, as we spoke about earlier, yeah. Europe has a good regulatory framework, but it's not very constructive. It is also quite stifling to an extent. But I think all of a sudden these trends are starting to reverse. Like to me, what we saw over the past few weeks, um, particularly at the Nashville conference, was like it was almost like a decade of right thinking by politicians in two weeks. And we had we had support from number one, and, I, and I've got no affiliation with either side, but we had support from Trump saying that they want to create a big Bitcoin reserve. And then RFK yeah. Jr., who I, I think was really speaking the most sense, turned around and said he wants to create the world's biggest Bitcoin reserve because the US has the world's biggest gold reserve. And that's that's buy and hold. That's not to trade. So they could take as much as 20%. And the US government has a lot of Bitcoin as it is. Already, so we yeah. start lining up all these factors. It's like interest rates, we've been saying they're going to come down. For some reason, the SEC, sort of the, SEC, the Fed, with its like 200 highly paid economists, hasn't figured out that inflation is like dead. Inflation driven by consumers is dead. And then number two, you're getting a better regulatory outlook because now instead of trying to like instead of regulation being trying to stifle it, and I think Gensler, this is his last gasp, this attack on OpenSea, which is, I can't even really reconcile what he's trying to do as an NFT. Like I can't understand how content creators are now securities traders. It's, it's very hard to find meaning and logic in that. Yeah. But I think that the tides have changed, to change, to turn, the political winds have shifted. So you have these three things lining up and, and then you have on the other side, the investors the uptake, the caliber of investors, the new funds, the new hedge funds and institutions as well as like BlackRock with their, it's not just the ETF, they've also built a tokenized on-chain money market fund. Metal, like, that's yeah. a huge stamp of approval. So to answer your question, we very, I'm very bullish on the outlook, but it's always, it's like sometimes it's the real world that seems to hold crypto back and then sometimes crypto itself, like with FTX, shoots itself in the foot. And hopefully none of, neither <laughs> of those two things happen and we have a, although I think between now and the elections, things are going to get a bit, a bit more volatile. Yeah, it seems to be up in the air. And, and the way I read this, Mark, is I put them in two different camps. I'm always the tech guy, so I'm looking at innovation, where things are heading. Mm -hmm. And innovation to me, in some cases, like if you look at Ethereum's layer one revenue has crashed almost by 99% since March um, mm -hmm. of this year. And the main reason is after the Duncan upgrade, which is the merge, the fee has been reduced and they made they paved the way for Ethereum L2s. There are 74 layer twos now and 21 layer three projects which are competing for resources that to me is innovation which means that things are becoming cheaper faster better and in general technology is deflationary the ethereum's economic model was deflationary which means that it should pave the way for utility which is what i have been always around utility of these infrastructures mm -hmm. so to me i'm looking at the innovation that Solana is doing, Avalanche, some of these leading layer one, layer two and integration protocols are doing in bringing real world use cases, which still the 900 trillion pound gorilla, which is the global economic footprint. Uh, these are the bankable assets. And I used to use the number of 500 trillion for the longest time till I was in this Coin Nashville conference, Mark, mm -hmm. where even more importantly than the 17 plus different senators and congressmen and ex-presidents who are there. And I got to listen to Donald Trump in, sitting in the audience. It was, the energy was simply amazing there. But what's to me stood out was presentation from Michael Saylor. So Michael mm -hmm. Saylor talked a lot about comparing 
Bitcoin to if it would be a percentage point in your portfolio of a retail investor, a common man, compared to a house, to a car, to corporate treasuries. It was a super interesting presentation from that perspective. And it all goes back to me is, okay, you have the digital goods and digital sort of narratives, you have technology innovations, but then you have now the US election, which throws a lot of uncertainty because as the Democratic, the incumbency is not exactly the friendliest as with SEC and Gary Gensler, he's been, he's given the free reign to some of the actions, the wealth notice that OpenSea has served and the Ripple, even though they've lost the Ripple, in, in principle lost the Ripple sort of lawsuit and everything else, this constant war on crypto. And until the election is settled, that's still going to be an open question. So I think till November, but I think that once we have clarity, whether it's Republican or Democrats, and as long as they have a thesis around it, I think it, the, the dark clouds move away and then we purely deal with merits, whether it's utility, valuation, and mm -hmm. consumption from enterprises or, and, the, and the institutions within the form of ETF and funds flowing, including in, our, in your business, Mark, where mm -hmm. your clients are concerned about the movement of, of the... So to me, there are two angles. One is innovation-led metrics that drive the consumption, that drive valuation. And then you have the regulatory uncertainty, the political uncertainty, which as the global landscape has, what, 75% of the global entities that can vote are in voting period this year. The central banks are changing rates in different directions. Usually they're not in tandem anymore. They're going in different directions. I think some of these things to me are markers that I'm looking for, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. I'd agree. Look, on the rights thing, the ECB's cut, PBSC's cut, RBA, I think, is going to cut in, in Australia. The housing issue is, is also starting to, to raise its head, both in the US and elsewhere. It's like rates are not going to dampen prices. You need supply so that, you know, You've had a big change in demographics and that's kind of part of the inflationary problem. I think what's important is, is, is and we've lived through this, where you go through those stages where it's like first, first they ridicule you, then they fight you, then they start talking to you and eventually it, it becomes adopted. And I think that's where we're at now. Because a couple of years ago, five years ago, when we started this business, let's say, and when we first met and started talking, Things like Web3 didn't really exist. NFTs yeah. didn't really exist. They were in the pipeline, but no one knew as and when. To say then, I remember Jamie Dimon saying he'd fire anyone who traded crypto. I remember BlackRock <laughs> saying he wouldn't touch it. I remember Warren Buffett and, and Charlie Munger saying it's rat poison. And so on and so forth. So it's gone from that. And then the SEC with its choke points, it destroyed good businesses like Signature. And it's now moved all the way across to where they're realizing, look, there's actually 40% of American adults Whatever that number really is, I don't know, but I think it could be as many as, let's just say conservatively 50 million people in the US that invest in or trade crypto. And I'd say the younger generation more so than the older generation. You're going to have this shift from baby boomers through to Gen X through to Gen Y, Gen Z and of, of wealth. That's going to continue. It's just a natural passage of time. And as the gatekeepers move away from focusing on bricks and mortar and industry and so on, that'll always be a part of it. But as you say, technology lowers cost curves. You've seen the Amazonification, as we call it, of cost curves globally, yeah. and that's going to continue. It's not, it's not like whether we want it to or not. It's just how AI and everything else is going to combine. And in some ways, there's always positive and negative benefits. But I think the bottom line is, as you said, there was Ethereum five years ago, not much yeah. else. Today, look at how many different providers you have, and that's going to continue. I think the second thing from my perspective is it's when... It's when something's not spoken about or ignored or doesn't have any energy. That's when I think it's, it's difficult not only to raise capital, but it falls into what you call the doldrums, where it doesn't go anywhere. Whereas I think now it's become a very topical discussion. And even the likes of whether the Trump side, the, the middle with, or the, on the other side, Harris, that campaign, as well as what's going on here in Europe, it is a form of, of libertarianism. I think when you see developers and owners of networks like Pavel Dural getting arrested in France after being invited there. Yeah. It's, it's like it makes you realize, okay, the, the, the incumbent system, which is now, it's passing away. The gatekeepers of old are starting to fall away, whether through age, you're gonna, you've had and will have in the next year the most CEO resignations you've seen in a decade. That's just happening. It's just, yeah. just mandatory. And I think one thing we can agree on is that the people running the world, particularly in the US, generally are out of touch in terms of their age. I, At 85, you shouldn't be doing much besides enjoying yourself. So I think the pendulum always shifts too far to one direction. 
but then you have a reversion to mean and it shifts all the way back and hopefully it doesn't overshoot in the other direction and then become the cowboy sort of environment again. We want regulation, we want to understand what the rules are, but we also want to be left alone to innovate and be entrepreneurs and create value. And that's where I think you're at now in, in your stage in, in terms of what you're doing. And we've been trying to get that, get that right for the past few years. And hopefully all the stars are starting to line up. Liquidity, the players, da, 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 it's all yeah. lining up. To me, one thing that is troubling for some of the global geopolitical events, and I agree with you, I think the stars are lining up. We've had a slump and there's ups and downs in this industry. And I'm, never, I'm generally not too concerned when things go down because at that point, this is going to go up and volatility mm. is a friend that we can leverage in terms of extracting value from any of the walls, as you have mentioned, Mark. One thing that to me has been rather concerning is, so we've always compared internet as information movement infrastructure and blockchain and DLT and crypto mm -hmm. industry is building the value movement infrastructure and it may manifest itself in different ways in future. Mm -hmm. But there's an attack on free speech, for example, which is the general tendency we've seen is that like with X and social media platform, X being banned in Brazil, mm -hmm. Pavel Durov being arrested, and then you have one of the Binance executives being, being arrested from a perspective where the Tigran Gambarian is he's invited. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if nation states, so he was invited by Nigerian government. He was arrested. Yeah. He's in house arrest. He's in bad health condition. And I'm surprised that the U.S. government has not stepped in because of the fact that he's a U.S. citizen. And I don't know if that's because in crypto and work for Binance, as opposed to all the stuff that we've done in the past in negotiating releases of the American citizens coming back home. Second thing to me was same thing with, Pavel Durov, he was invited by the government for a meal and he was arrested. And I'm just wondering, do you trust the nation state now? Are we losing? Is that trust eroding of where there's no word of, there's no principled approach to, hey, you're invited in our country and we will honor and respect that. And even though we have an arrest yeah. warrant, for example. So to me, I find that an attack on free speech and if free speech can be attacked or we cannot rely upon the social norms of how we... I think the war on crypto would be imminent in that in those circumstances, because if we can't tolerate a contrarian opinion, how do we to tolerate a, a alternative currency? That to me yeah, is I mean, a bigger I mean, concern in the long run. No, I think the war is actually, I think the war is over. I think there's still some battles that need to be won. I think it's going to be cleaned up. I think free speech is, is, is playing out. They've tried censorship in the UK now. They, they, they bring people in prison for posting things on Facebook, right? And they're letting dangerous criminals out to make space for that. I, when I look at what happened, and, and it's, it's actually, it's not my, I'm not saying this from my perspective, I'm saying I watched the, the latest Joe Rogan Netflix special. And he says before COVID, he was like very much, vaccines are the most important things. Coming out of COVID, he's like the moon landing's fake, the earth's flat. So there's all these, <laughs> these crazy conspiracies that people are now like saying, maybe there's something there. And I think what it is, is that people have realized maybe our governments don't have our best interests at heart. Maybe, they, maybe the rules that are put in place are there to serve the people that have, that have the ability to lobby, the people that hold wealth. And the middle class has been, has truthfully been, not decimated, but there's been a massive transfer of wealth from the middle class to, to what you'd call the, some of the tech titans and the elites. And that is, people tend to not react much when things are easier, when you can afford your home and afford your car and afford food. And people tend to be a bit more complacent. But you've seen, and even places like Australia before I left, I couldn't believe our homelessness was going up. You have yeah. the same social issues. And the, the only way then is when the truth is then coming out, the governments have to go out of their way to, to suppress it even harder. But it doesn't work. It, it has never traditionally worked, and it won't work in this instance. And particularly it won't work now because everyone has access to, so, so not just social media, people are not just relying on their news coming from, 60 minutes in CNN. Like I grew up believing that they were telling me the truth. I really did. I believe what they were saying. Now citizen journalists have got way more followers. The yeah, podcast sure. likes of the Joe Rogans and Sean Ryan, etc. have 10 times the followers of any of CNN's top show. That's right. So yeah. I think it's what's happening with crypto is it's unstoppable. And we've believed this from the past. And it's unstoppable because it's decentralized. It's decentralized. There's no one who can turn the node off unless you turn the internet off, in which case, what's fiat then in any event? Because everything, you don't have cash. No one uses cash anymore. From my perspective, the adoption rates are only going to be accelerated as we move forward. And as people realize, particularly the younger generation who understand 
that they, they've been thrown overboard. Like they're never going to afford a house. <laughs> this is not going to happen. That's You're true. not going to be able to afford a house on, on, on a 20 year view. It's just, it's done. So how else do you make money? It's the gig economy, it's Web3, it's develop your own apps, and it's crypto. That's one of the last real bastions for young people to achieve. That's a really good point, Mark, because we've all, I've written on this topic in the past of future of work, and I think that Web3, to me, the platform in general gives you avenues for anybody anywhere in the world to be able to practice their craft, whether it's art, whether it's music, whether it's coding, they build the right code and deploy interesting things and bid for projects online and get paid in this currency that's easily transmissible to, to, to any, big, any part of the world. I think all these are positive things. And on the innovation side, as you may have seen, Coinbase announced a few things between AI to AI payments. And this is something which we've been contemplating in the industry for quite some time. In fact, when I was at IBM, uh, there was a movement where suddenly you had a model where we could have space payments, which is what JP Morgan did. So when I was in Austria, I worked with somebody else who was working on a uh, space economy, which is how do the various LEOs, the, the low earth orbital satellites avail each other's services because they have to communicate with each other and how do you pay for these bandwidth mm -hmm. on this planet while things mm -hmm. are happening is interplanetary. So we have this interplanetary file system. So all these innovations, whether it's sharing of data, sharing of bandwidth, somebody's paying for it the newer model, I think that to me is the silver lining and the innovation that I think I look forward to. That'll change any of the narratives that we've had, whether it's geopolitical, whether it's regulatory and compliance related, or whether it's governments around the world trying to stymie the innovation from that perspective. So that's my hope, Mark. But a few things before we wrap things up, and I'd love to have you, you have the last word on mm. forward-looking thinking around where the industry is heading, where do you think the price movement will happen for at least the marquee assets as well as the all coins. But as Derek and me will be in Singapore. So for our audiences, reach out to us uh, at Token2049. In fact, Derek is the Portal Asset Management and Derek are hosting an event on the 17th at Raffles. Um, so reach out to us, attend that event. It's going to be a lot of thought leadership exchange. I will be there. I'll be discussing the technical innovation in the industry and how that's changing the landscape. So that's for the audiences, but looking forward to meeting a lot of our mm -hmm. thought leaders and investors in this space uh, at Token 2049 in, in, in Singapore. Uh, I know, Mark, you're not there because you just got back from your amazing mm -hmm. vacation. Hopefully the markets improve as we discussed early on, mm -hmm. but love to get uh, a last word from you before we wrap this. Yeah, since, since I'm not going on leave for six months, we should see a bull market. <laughs> so it should be good. I think often when you go through the storm that we've gone through with the reduction of liquidity in 2022, all the bankruptcies, the, the operation choke points, you name it, FTX, like we really got hit. And there's no bailouts, there's no backstop in, in the space. You come out of the storm and sometimes you don't realize that you're out of the storm because you're still licking your wounds and just trying to wonder where things are moving to next. In my opinion, and, and it's, it's an opinion based on obviously a lot of research and experience in the space, but in my opinion, when I take a look at how fast this industry has grown, not just in terms of the tokens, I'm talking about in terms of the technological innovation, but the quality of people that I've seen come into the space and the, the, the actual build out of infrastructure like custody solutions, how exchanges are run, regulations, so on and so forth. Like the industry's moved ahead, even though it's moved very quickly, it's moved ahead much quicker than even I thought it would. And I thought it would be pretty quick. I, I had a seven year number in my head. So I thought we'd be where we are today, only by 2025, 26, and we're already there. And I so think moving there, yeah. So I think now that you've hit this tipping point, it's Moore's law that gets sped up, Bayes law, it's gonna, it's gonna increase even quicker. And people like family offices, endowments, institutions that are looking to say, we don't have to worry about next quarter or next year, our, our asset and liability matching is in place for five to 10 years. And we're getting this flow in every month of whether it's insurance premiums or, or pension contributions. Should we not look at a way of maybe taking a little bit out of gold or a little bit out of this or a little bit out of collectibles and putting it to work here? The difference is that unlike dollars and equities in some instances, there's not just more being printed all the time. Yes, there's new tokens, but a lot of the tokens, particularly Bitcoin as you know, and Ethereum to an extent, have a deflationary aspect to them. So I do think people are underestimating what the power of reduced supply with almost exponentially increasing demand and technological innovation, like how those three things are going to come together. We're just waiting for a clear signal. Once we see the what we call the Bitcoin and Ethereum and Solana's rally, and I think that's going to be the next move, you're going to see this 
rotation, the second order liquidity flow into the alts. And I think we're going to see a lot of value creation there. So I, I have no idea when, like time in the market, I always say is to make astrology mm -hmm. look respectable or the Fed's economists look respectable in this way. But I do know that it's, it's definitely a when. It's not, a, it's not an if. And when it does come through, I think people are going to be surprised at the order of magnitude as the, what they call reflexivity, other people getting sucked into the trade, yeah. particularly on the retail side, kicks in. I ah, hope everything you're saying comes true, Mark. But uh, always good chatting with you. I love our conversations on and off the air. But looking forward to our next conversation. And we're going to miss you at Singapore, uh, Mark, because the team will be there. We'll probably give you a shout out from there. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Always enjoy our conversations with you. I will keep the economy ticking over here in, uh, in Germany. Do, that, do yeah. the same there in the US. Yeah. And let's see. Sounds good. Take care, Mark. Stay Cheers, well. Mate. Bye.